Ranger William here from the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. This video is part two of our new program, That Hated Scotsman, Patrick Ferguson as a soldier, officer, and leader in the American Revolution. Now, the reason we're doing this program, kind of really looking at the British officer who's being pursued by the Overmountain men, pursued down the Overmountain Victory Trail, is to gain kind of a better understanding of who he was and why it makes such a big deal that he was killed at the Battle of Kings Mountain on October 7th, 1780. And there's that little stone pillar at Kings Mountain National Military Park with the three short words, here Ferguson fell, and why that meant so much to Southern loyalists and the Southern strategy of the British Army. Now in our first episode, a little bit of a recap we talked about his early life in Edinburgh, Scotland, his family being in a lot of enlightenment thinker circles. Um, so this kind of environment of asking questions, challenging authority and thinking outside the box, um, including some of his family connections with the British military and also the Jacobite rebellion during the 1740s. Now, we then talked about his early military career, his first taste of military life with the uh, Military Academy in London at 12 years old, then at 15, the Royal North British Dragoons and being sent to fight in the Seven Years' War in, against uh, the French forces in continental Europe. We talked about him serving with the Dragoons, what kind of service that was like, um, some uh, stories of his, his bravery, and then also his catching of synovial tuberculosis. Uh, we then talked about how that really forced him out of service. Um, he's going to recover at the family estate. He's going to return to uh, service with his regiment, but the war has ended. And he's going to be stuck with this kind of like policing duty, policing service in these small towns, some larger cities. Um, but it really does not care for this kind of service. This does not agree with him. And his quote here from one letter to his family, I wish, therefore, it would please his majesty either to allow me money to hire a nurse to keep me constantly asleep or hang me or send me abroad. So now that we are starting part two, Ferguson is going to get his wish and he's going to see the empire. Now, we are gonna uh, pick up with him in 1768, in that December. Um, he's going to sell his commission in the Royal North British Dragoons and use that money to purchase a captaincy, a vacant spot in the 70th Regiment of Foot, also known as the Glasgow Lowland Regiment. Now, this is actually commanded by his cousin, Colonel Alexander Johnston. And with this regiment, he sails for service in uh, South and Central America, in the Caribbean. Now, they're going to arrive for garrison duty, and uh, mainly the idea is Granada, uh, but they're going to have a brief service at Fort Royal on St. George, and it's um, then going to be transferred over to Tobago. Now, it's while in Tobago, there are going to be two enslaved revolts, um, insurrections, revolts, rebellions of the enslaved Africans and Afro-Caribbeans who are the main workforce on these uh, plantations, on the uh, these islands. Um, and we don't really know how active the 70th Regiment was in these rebellions. Um, were they sent out from their garrison to take kind of offensive operations? Were they posted in towns? Did they stay in their fort? I, I don't have the details on that, uh, but this is going to be some of Ferguson's next military experience. He's seen what it's like to be in large battles, to fight the French, and now you're seeing this kind of service against a, uh, a insurrection, against a rebellion, um, very kind of racially motivated. Um, so a very different kind of service here. Now, when he is um, in Tobago, not only do you see this military service, but he's gonna kind of follow in his cousin's footsteps. Uh, his cousin had purchased an estate on the island, and so does Patrick. September 5th, 1769, he purchases the Castara estate, uh, about 300 acres on the northeast side of the island. And in fact, the large picture here in the background of our slide, this is the Castara estate. Um, I got this from uh, eveningstandard.com. I was able to find a, a photograph of the, uh, the actual property that Patrick Ferguson had purchased. Um, now, the, the main reason you're gonna want this kind of plantation and want this kind of property is how well sugarcane grows in that climate. Um, so using enslaved Africans and Afro-Caribbeans as the main workforce, you're going to see this plantation export rum, sugar, molasses, all kinds of sugar-based products back to Great Britain. Now, Patrick, I'm not sure how much time he actually spends there. Um, the main kind of manager of his plantation is gonna be his little brother, George Ferguson who's actually going to become very well known on the island, actually get political leadership of the island during the uh, course of the revolution. Um, 
So it's going to be mostly through George that this property is managed. Now in 1771, just a couple years after purchasing the Castara estate, you're going to see Ferguson get kind of a kind of a promotion. He's going to go from being just a captain in the regiment to a captain of the light infantry company. Um, what that is, you're looking at the, your standard British infantry regiment having 10 companies of soldiers, eight of them being the hack companies, the regular standard infantry. Then you have the grenadier company and the light infantry company. Uh, so grenadiers are going to be the, uh, the the larger guys, the, the bigger guys. Um, historically, they would have been issued with cast iron grenades to throw at the enemy. And then you have the light infantry, usually the most agile, most nimble men, the best marksmen of the regiment put into that company to act as skirmishers, sharpshooters, flankers, that kind of stuff. Um, so Ferguson is given command of these light infantry. Now in 1772, he's going to return to Scotland, where he's then going to be sent out on recruiting service for the 70th. Um, so what that means is he's going to take either um, part of his company, a few of the other kind of very... Um, distinguished officers and soldiers and they're going to go in different places different taverns different community markets and just kind of demonstrate how great life can be in the british army show off these stable uh, food clothing pay things that may not have been guaranteed in the civilian world the british army could offer if you wanted to also get some adventure and do some travel um, this is not the time period of, you see, men being forced into service, and British soldiers are convicts and uh, homeless, um, not just people that are grabbed off the street, but you're going to see volunteers. Um, for almost their entire period of the American Revolution, the British Army is a purely volunteer force. So having these officers out, showing how great it can be, showing what it would be like to be in the British Army, it's going to be a main recruiting service here. So Ferguson is with this uh, recruiting party in London in 73. Um, then you see him 1774 really kind of uh, progress in this light infantry career. He's going to be sent to a training school in Ireland under Major General Howe. Uh, what you're seeing happening here is um, this idea of having troops as skirmishers, light infantry, it's not terribly new. Um, it's really kind of highlighted in the French and Indian War, the service in North America, um, how essential these kinds of tactics can be. So you've had the light infantry companies created, but now that's actually been codified even more. Um, you're seeing these training books, new manuals about how best to be skirmishers, flankers, how best to be light infantry. So Ferguson is going to be one of the officers sent to these training schools just before the American Revolution. Now, when the revolution breaks out, um, Ferguson is going to be um, still kind of in that training school, still with the 70th Regiment, but he's going to be thinking about um, a rifle. He's going to be thinking about mechanical things, improvements. Again, always kind of thinking outside the box, um, going back to his studying of engineering and artillery back at the Woolwich Military Academy. Perhaps that had a little bit of influence on this part of his life, but he is going to start experimenting with some improvements of an old 1705 French design for a breech-loading rifle. Now, I'm going to pull up my little uh, laser pointer here so you can kind of see what we're talking about. On the very bottom left picture here, where you have the um, the, the side view, the flintlock rifle here, um, you have the trigger coming down out of the wooden stock, and usually the trigger guard, this longer piece of metal along the bottom, that would be flush up against the stock. The idea here is to make like a, a protective covering of that trigger to keep the weapon from being misfired or the trigger from being damaged. Um, but the way this design is different is that the uh, trigger guard is actually a handle attached to a plug that goes up into the bottom of the rifle through the barrel, through the chamber of the barrel. Now, when, with a one rotation, um, and that's one of Ferguson's designs, is he wants to have 10, 11 threads on this screw so that just one rotation would drop that plug enough to open up the barrel from the top. Um, so that's going to be the next picture over here on the uh, to the right. Um, this is a view down into that open chamber. Now, with the, the rifling grooves inside the barrel, that what would cause the ball to spin, um, if you insert that rifle ball into that chamber, it's going to roll forward a little, a small piece, but then it's going to stop. It's going to be caught by those rifling grooves, so it won't just roll out the end of the muzzle. 
Um, and once the ball stops in that little chamber, you would then fill the rest of that chamber with gunpowder, just dumping it right down there into that top opening. And then when you swivel the trigger guard back, closing that uh, plug, pushing that plug back up, it's gonna push out a little bit of that extra gunpowder, which you can then just sweep off with your thumb, with a finger and push it over um, into the side, into the pan. And that would be your priming charge. It's going to initially catch the spark from that flint and steel and cause the weapon to fire. Um, so this is going to be some of his improvements. He wants to have uh, numerous threads on that plug. He's gonna have in the, um, on the threads inside the, uh, inside the barrel, um, one problem would be the residue of the gunpowder, the fouling, clogging up those threads, kind of jamming up the mechanism. He's going to add a little additional side channel to those threads so that powder residue would be pushed over into that side channel and the weapon can still function. That mechanism can still close. That's going to be a, a few of his ideas. Uh, one other thing he's going to do in this top image here, this great painting by Don Troiani, uh, one of Ferguson's riflemen, um, you have this very long bayonet stuck into the ground beside the soldier. Um, one problem with these rifles is that they're a little bit shorter than your standard muzzle-loading musket. And so if you get in hand-to-hand -hand combat with musket-wielding troops, when they're coming at you with their bayonets, um, that shorter rifle would not be able to fight back. Um, so what Ferguson's going to do, he's just going to make a longer bayonet. He's going to make this extra long bayonet to fit on the end of the rifle, giving him just as much, if not more, of a reach than your standard muzzle-loading musket. He's also going to put a um, adjustable rear sight on the top of that barrel to make it a very accurate weapon at all distances. Now, um, while he's working on these ideas, he's putting this together, he's going to pitch this idea in 1775. Um, by this time, the American Revolution has already started. The British are interested in these kind of unconventional rifle ideas. They've actually ordered 1,000 rifles to be made, uh, more of a traditional muzzle-loading rifle based on the style used by the uh, some of the Hessian Jaeger companies, uh, some German marksmen, sharpshooters that are going to be hired by the um, British government from the different princes of the different German states to come and fight in the American Revolution. Um, so you have a, about, about a thousand of those uh, muzzle-loading rifles put into the hands of some of the light infantry companies. Um, and on April 27th, uh, 1776, Ferguson is going to demonstrate this for some army officials, uh, proving that it's, if this works, it's very accurate, it's very quick loading. He's going to demonstrate again on June 1st. Um, this time he's firing in a pouring down rainstorm at shots you know, targets 200 yards away while he's laying down on his back, on his stomach, really showing the versatility of this kind of weapon. Now, he's going to prove in October of 1776, October 1st, he's going to show for the king himself that this is not just Ferguson being fancy. He has taken six men, he's trained them in how to use this weapon, they demonstrate successfully, and Ferguson gets permission to create his this kind of experimental core of riflemen. These guys are going to last for one campaign season. They're going to prove their worth in a single campaign, and then we're going to see where we go from there. Um, so it's going to be March of 1777 that Ferguson is going to have a bunch of stuff going on. He receives a patent for his improvements to the 1705 design. He is uh, March 11th. He and his experimental corps are going to sail for North America. Um, they never get the full 100 guys. Uh, they never all get Ferguson rifles. Uh, some muskets are sprinkled in there. Um, and on March 15th, as he is sailing over to North America, sailing into combat, um, the revolution is in full swing by 77. The Northern Campaign is going on. Um, he's going to write his will. Uh, just in case something happens, he wants to make sure his family is taken care of, especially with directions to George, his younger brother, taking care of the Castara estate. He um, explains to George how the profits, the proceeds from the plantation are to be divvied up amongst his mother and sisters. Um, so Ferguson is very conscious of their well-being, even though his father hasn't passed yet. Um, he wants to have his family taken care of. On September 11th, 1777, September 11th, the Battle of Brandywine, Ferguson and his guys are going to get their chance to prove themselves. They're going to be scouting for the British Army. They're going to be on the very front edges of the battle. Um, and by the time this battle is done, one of the larger battles of the American Revolution, you see uh, Ferguson's marksmen have a smaller casualty ratio than any other 
British unit on the field. So proving that their use of unconventional tactics, their great marksmanship, their kind of semi-camouflage kind of uniforms is going to be effective. Now there's a story from during this battle um, where Ferguson was scouting out for the British lines. He encounters some American officers scouting out for their side, and he's going to call on the officers to surrender. One of them tears off and flees. The other one simply boldly looks him in the face, turns, and slowly rides away. And Ferguson talks about this. He says that he could have easily shot this officer down, but he didn't think it was right to shoot an unoffending individual. Um, this guy was not leading combat. He was not attacking. He was just taking a look, and he was bravely showing himself and retreating, uh, much the way Ferguson did when he was a young dragoon fighting against the French. Um, the story of him calmly retreating back to his lines after picking up his dropped pistol. Um, so Ferguson does not take the shot. Now, the story goes that after the battle, um, or after that uh, that uh, instance, that occasion, that meeting, um, he hears, you know, well, the commander of the rebels, George Washington, was out doing some scouting. That may have been him. So I have not seen enough evidence to confirm that that was or was not George Washington. Um, but Ferguson supposedly said, hey, even if it had been, my reason still stands. I would not have taken the shot. Now, we talked about how Ferguson's guys have the lowest casualty ratio of the entire battle. That's true. However, one of their casualties is Patrick himself. He's going to take a uh, musket ball to the right elbow, just shattering those bones there. Um, he's going to be in a field hospital convalescing for several months. He is not going to lose his arm. They're not going to amputate like would have been traditional practice for that kind of injury, but he is going to use most of the use of that arm. We're not sure of the extent of the, the muscle atrophy, um, but he does have to kind of reteach himself to use his left hand for most things, or if not all things. Um, now, while he is in hospital, you do see his his uh, corps, his marksmen, they still have their experimental campaign. They're still proving themselves. So on September 20th, 1777, Ferguson's marksmen are going to be part of the British Light Infantry Groups and some light cavalry led by General Charles Gray in a night attack at Paoli Tavern. Uh, this is where you've got some American troops under General Anthony Wayne. They have gone into camp. They have not really set enough guards or pickets, um, and they are going to be surprised in the night. Uh, this is painting. I'm going to turn off my uh, turn off my video here so you can better see this painting. This painting by Xavier Delegata of this night attack by General Charles Gray uh, is going to earn the nickname No Flint Gray because of his orders to his men to remove the flints from their muskets so no one accidentally misfires and warns the Americans that they're coming. But this nighttime attack, bayonets all over the place. And then here, circled in yellow, you have these green jacketed Ferguson marksmen, those extra long bayonets on their rifles here. Um, so they are seeing service even though Ferguson is not with them. Now, after the, that battle, about 200 Americans are going to be killed or wounded, uh, 71 captured, only four British killed, and seven wounded. Um, so, very one-sided. Um, some call it Paoli's Massacre. Uh, you see all these different kind of uh, surprise nighttime attacks happening around this around this period. Um, it's going to kind of impact Ferguson a little bit, even though he's not there personally. Um, he's going to try and kind of make up for missing out on this kind of thing. So you also see him. Uh, you also see Patrick Ferguson visiting Stony Point, this British outpost on the Hudson River that is going to be very kind of crucial for controlling the river traffic. He's going to make suggestions on how to better defend that post using his engineering education back at Woolwich Academy. Um, and it's funny, he's there just shortly before that post is captured at a bayonet attack by General Anthony Wayne, um, the man who was surprised by a bayonet attack at Paoli Tavern. Now he's getting a little bit of vengeance here and he's capturing this British outpost. Now Ferguson's gonna really kind of, um, really get outside the box when you look at October of 1778. On October 14th, he is going to raid a privateer base at Chestnut Neck on the Connecticut, 
Connecticut coast. Um, he is going to have his this uh, kind of thrown together group of light infantry. They are going to take whale boats, row boats, like you see down here in the bottom image, and they are going to row up river. They're going to find these privateer bases, guys who are raiding British merchants. They are helping supply the American army, and they are going to burn warehouses, um, shipyards, a few vessels uh, that are docked along the river. Um, and in response to this, the American army says, well, we'll we'll stop that. We're going to post uh, Pulaski's Legion. Um, he is a foreign volunteer who has come and volunteered uh, his service for the American uh, American army. His regiment is uh, mostly going to be uh, other foreign volunteers, also some British deserters, so men who know military, who know fighting. Um, they're going to be posted at Little Egg Harbor. They're kind of trying to uh, deter and keep Ferguson from doing any more raids. And when Ferguson hears about this, he's like, well, I'll show you. The very next night, October 15th, he rose back to that same area, rose to Little Egg Harbor, and in a um, this surprise bayonet night attack, he attacks Pulaski's camp, um, killing 50 um, while only losing three of his own men. Um, now, later on, he's going to be kind of criticized for uh, by some of the Americans for how, how vicious the attack was, how little a quarter was given. And Ferguson, in reply, explained, well, it being a night attack, little quarter could, of course, be given. It's like, look, it's dark, it's chaos, it's moving fast. I'm not going to take time and show mercy and take prisoners. This is a quick raid. This is what happens. Um, and also, I've heard some historians speculate that, especially when it came to Pulaski's Legion, them being foreign volunteers, them being British deserters, um, the British Army specifically kind of targeted these guys out a little more than if they were just American Continentals. Now, later that month, October 25th, 1779, you see Ferguson get a transfer. He's going to go from being a captain in the 70th Regiment, the Glasgow Lowlanders, Lowlanders, and he's going to become a major in the 71st Highlanders, 71st Highland Regiment. So this portrait that we have over here on the far side, uh, here's a locket of Ferguson in that 70th the Lowland Regiment of Foot. Um, you see these kind of gold wings on his uniform, marking him as a light infantry officer. Um, the 71st Regiment had white facings on their coat, so these dark facings here, uh, likely to be the 70th Regiment. And one little neat detail, his fashionable little braid on top of his head. Um, his hair, of course, grown long, pulled back into a queue, but this one long braid kind of kept separate. Um, you see some of the younger, more fashionable officers kind of doing this. So here's Ferguson rocking the braid style there. Now, you see Ferguson, he's been given this uh, commission in the 71st. Um, what is going to be next for him? We're going to end our part two here, but here's a little sneak peek. Part three, come back for that one. We're heading south, getting to the Southern Campaign. Ferguson's next big project, the American Volunteers. We'll talk more about that in part three, but there you've had part two, looking at Ferguson, um, seeing the empire, getting a variety of experiences all throughout the British Atlantic world. You're gonna see him design the improvements for this rifle, get a chance to use it, but be horribly injured in combat, losing the use of his right arm. You're gonna see him be just, again, not be slowed down, looking for ways to prove himself. These ideas, these suggestions, these recommendations, raiding privateer bases, improving defenses of Stony Point, very outside the box suggestions to Sir Henry Clinton. And now we'll see what happens when Ferguson gets a little bit of leash. He gets a kind of uh, the opportunity to put these ideas into service. So thank you all for watching. I'm Ranger William from the Overmountain Victory National Historic Trail. Again, this was just part two of that hated Scotsman. So go back and catch part one, watch out for part three, and I hope you enjoy.